Shepeshaj, I'm uh, Dr. Rania Prevenza, one of the uh, adult cardiac surgeons and associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. This year, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons introduced for first time the diversity and inclusion session in the within the city surgery, and uh, they actually implement uh, this session in the main program. This is a very important topic, and this round table is actually dedicated to this. I would, if um, I can make a moment to introduce our speakers. Uh, Dr. Bob Higgins, I'm the first vice president. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon and uh, look forward to uh, joining you. I'm Jessica Donington. I'm a general thoracic surgeon and associate professor at NYU. I'm the immediate past president of the Women in Thoracic Surgery. And I'm Tony Estrero. I'm a professor at McGovern Medical School in Houston, Texas. I'm an adult cardiac surgeon and pleased to be here. So if we can start, um, they do say that diversity is very smart for business in the corporate world. And there's no way that it's going to be any less for our speciality. So if we can make a moment to just define what diversity and inclusion means. Well, from my perspective, it's not only inviting members of uh, underrepresented groups in our specialty to join in our activities academically and educationally and research, but it's also creating an environment where they feel welcomed and able to participate and uh, a recognition that their participation enriches all of our experiences, not just for the minorities, but also for the majority. And if I were to think about uh, diversity, it is about um, creating opportunity, but also um, inclusion in the activities of our specialty and our profession. I think diversity and inclusion, the ultimate goal is to make our profession reflect our populations that we treat. We should look like our patients and there's no reason for us not to. And I do believe that the same way that makes people more comfortable when they go to buy a car. It makes people more comfortable when they decide that they need to have heart surgery. Um, I think we all develop bonds with our patients differently and having a more diverse population to do that, I think it just improves the care for our patients. And I have to really second uh, a lot of what has been said. Uh, I also would add that uh, it's respecting, providing this mutual respect for everyone else's attitudes and thoughts and and listening really listening to others because everyone has something to add in a conversation and wh whether it's the patient or your medical student or your resident I think that's very important and I also have to echo the aspect of uh, making people feel comfortable where they are and also being able to advance, because that's, that's been a big issue in our profession, is that there's a lot of folks involved early on, and in what, for whatever reason, there, there doesn't seem to be that ability for folks to be able to advance, especially in our profession. And that, that needs to change. Uh, great, so I just want to make uh, sure that our audience understands that diversity means that we keep high standards and we just increase the, pool, we increase the pool of talented people that are interested in our speciality. And I think these are the thoughts of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and our society um, in, in the whole. So, um, uh, Tony, as an Asian American, have placed the fact that you are Asian American, does this have placed some of your patients at ease? or made the, uh, their uh, health care uh, experiences more comfortable? Yeah, I, I do think so. I do think so. But, but having said that, you know, Asian is a very broad category. And, uh, and, um, and the reality is there's no question, you know, if I'm, I was born in the Philippines originally, <coughs> and my father was a surgeon, and we, we emigrated in the early, late 60s here. So we grew up during that, or at least I grew up during that era, so I could, I could sort of fully understand a lot of the challenges growing up uh, really as a, as a young Asian American. But having said that, you know, there's no question that when, when a Filipino patient gets referred to me, they feel very comfortable. And, and although I don't understand Tagalog, you know, I, my family spoke Cebuano, we'll start to speak the language and, and they definitely feel comfortable. 
Uh, I, I'm not certain about Japanese or Chinese as much, uh, but I think, I think on top of that, we're not going to compromise when we're talking about inclusion and diversity, but on the flip side, we want them to feel comfortable, and we, we have to really start centering on the patient. And, and I completely agree, if a patient comes into our, our office and sees a diverse group of folks, they're going to, for the most part, most patients are going to feel comfortable. I mean, they Thank really you, are. that's a great point. Dr. Higgins, um, we extremely value the contribution of the community cardiothoracic surgeons and the service that they provide uh, to our patients. How the society can actually empower the community cardiothoracic surgeons to help them contribute actively and be members of task forces, workforces, and leadership positions? Well, I think that's a very good point. Um, we have many people in leadership roles who have come from academic environments, but uh, by far and away, the majority of uh, practitioners who are members of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons are folks who have community-based practices in a non-academic setting. And their voice, their concerns, their issues are paramount to our understanding of our total specialty. And our leadership is uh, recommitting our efforts to help um, give a voice to those in the community who bring real life experiences and concerns, but also uh, provide the, uh, uh, the majority of the fantastic care that our patients are the beneficiaries of. Yeah, so we're very excited about including uh, more folks from the community uh, in leadership positions and task forces and workforces and in leadership positions and hope that uh, we'll get the full uh, uh, view of our specialty from both academic and uh, community-based practitioners. Thank you, that's very important. Uh, Jessica, uh, it's true that minorities and women currently are underrepresented in cardiothoracic surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, women comprised, according to the last uh, American Association of Medical Colleges report, only 6%, and we're second before the last, with last being orthopedic surgery with 5%, unfortunately. But anyway, things are improving, no mm -hmm. question about it. What I would like to ask you is that, because always this comes up, how these minorities and the women are actually are able to move up and obtain leadership position. What do you think is missing right now? And what are the steps to take to just make this better? Yeah, I have to say this is one of the things I'm starting to be a little disappointed about. You look around at the meeting this year and there are a lot of women in the audience. There's no doubt about it. There's more than there's ever been. And when we look at the medical students and the residents, they're, they're, the proportion of women is so much higher than it's ever been. But I don't feel like women necessarily move up as quickly as some of our male colleagues. Um, I think some of it, or I like to believe that some of it is still based in unconscious bias. I don't like to think that anyone's trying to keep women down. I don't think they are. I don't think people are trying to keep people of color down. But I think that we are all more in tune to choosing someone who looks like us, who we know, who we trained for a position than to go out on a limb and say, oh, I think that person can do the job also, even though they don't look like me or I didn't train them personally. So I do think women maybe need a few more sponsors out there. And right now, most of those sponsors will be men. Uh, and I think we're a little without those right now. So that means that um, every minority, including minorities, uh, race, uh, different races, ethnicity, gender, Everybody needs a mentor, needs an advocate, and needs a champion. Yeah. Um, and I think that's actually very important for everybody to understand. Um, what I would like to ask you also is that all of you, you are prominent leaders um, in our field. How you actually have you prepared yourself to be in the position that you are today? And if there were any mentors or champions that actually fostered a sense of inclusion in our speciality? Well, I'm uh, fortunate to be the beneficiary of extraordinary mentorship, but also this idea of sponsorship. And uh, if I look around the room at the past presidents of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, um, many uh, have been so important in my career 
and uh, helping me to understand how the association works, uh, what are the priorities, as well as recognizing my contributions in my area of specialty and interest, education, research, transplantation, adult cardiac surgery. And it's been that level of sponsorship, as well as the mentorship one-on-one, -on -one, that's led to uh, this extraordinary opportunity that I will, uh, uh, will come to a reality uh, in, in a very short period of time. And as I think the panel is going to recognize, uh, we all benefit from that level of support throughout the organization and a recognition that um, it's not just about race or ethnicity. It's about performance, excellence, and um, uh, contribution to our community and the patients we serve. So I'm honored to have the many people behind me. I'm standing on all their shoulders and look forward to their support uh, when leadership opportunities are uh, realized. Thank you. We're looking forward for your uh, presidency. Jessica? I feel the same way. I think uh, as a general thoracic surgeon, I grew up with a love of cancer and a fear of cardiac. And it was obviously a strong male mentor who looked at me and said, are you kidding me? You can do this. And without that person, I don't know what I'd be right now, probably a breast surgeon somewhere. So I think that we all need mentors and, and we can't go without them. And I've been very fortunate. I've only been trained by the utmost gentlemen throughout my entire career. Um, I think in order to keep moving, we have to be ready. When that opportunity comes, when someone, when a sponsor finds a way to get you that next position, that next opportunity, the NIH study section, you have to go and you have to do it well because that's where your next one comes from. Um, and as women, we tend to second doubt ourselves. Can I do this? Can I do this? I can do this. And I think you have to be ready and you have to deliver. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, <coughs> I you know, have to agree with all the comments. Uh, mentor, mentorship's been very important. And, and as we move forward, we also have to be good mentors in, 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 and good examples in what we do. I mean, my, you know, you know me. My mentor was Hazem Safi, who was probably one of the most deconstructed pe persons on the world in the world, and and he. he my was mentor is Joseph Coselli, so <laughs> I can. So I can they work actually, together. To I can fair. rely on that. <laughs> they they work together, but I'll tell you, he was. Uh, he's very blind, you know, not, not visually, but he sees everyone as the same, and he always has this comment that, you know. Uh, uh, we're all 99.89% the same by genetics. But he always tells me, my 0.01% is just a little bit better than yours. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, he was my mentor. And, and so I grew up, you know, at least in my training and in the last 20 years, just visually blind in a lot of ways. So it's, it's changing this, this culture, though, becomes very important because a survey that, that they showed yesterday in their meeting showed 65 to 70% of people membership feel it's important but if you flip it 35 percent don't feel it's important and that's concerning to me but maybe that's better and maybe you know other professions feel the same but i think we just need to to change the culture really so the culture. i think it's very important is the education yeah. how we educate ourselves others our patients to just minimize all the unconscious bias, because there is this in-group favoritism. Yeah. This is a, true is a true fact. So in your organization, do you have any specific steps that you take through education, through seminars, um, or any other activities, so you can make sure that we don't have any more, or we don't have so many unconscious bias? Well, we have a, uh, a very uh, formal process of trying to raise awareness of implicit and unconscious bias. And in fact, it's intended to uh, make us more uh, um, uh, culturally competent and improving uh, our dexterity as professionals. And so uh, we welcome those opportunities. And once uh, people are aware, uh, they uh, perform at a very high level. Yeah. And so we're optimistic that this kind of activity, uh, as outlined by Dr. Prager and the uh, board, um, will help to open the door to recognition of uh, where there are uh, shortfalls and how we can be more uh, culturally aware uh, and more welcoming of uh, diverse ideas and uh, include people 
in the uh, process of uh, leading the uh, society of thoracic surgery. And I think that's actually true because the society does feel that diversity means excellence. And that's the only way to improve and serve our patients better. So I would like to thank all of you for being here. I would like to thank the society for putting this program together. And definitely we look forward for more. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.